Praise be to Jesus Christ and welcome to Catholic Forum. I'm your host, Deacon Jim Thorndell. I want to welcome all those who are joining us on public TV and those who will be joining us on podcasts. It's, it's always our privilege to be able to come into your living room or your wherever you're watching, the bedroom, the dining room. Maybe you're listening to us in your car, but it's our privilege to really help you understand a deeper understanding of who we are as Catholics and what it means to live a Catholic life. And in many times, we don't have that um, luxury sometimes of hearing the truth spoke to us. And this is, a, I say, spoken to us. And this is really a time when we can kind of uplift ourselves and learn from one another what it means to live in a Catholic world. I'm sure there's a time in our lives that many of us don't think about it. And it, it happened many years ago, back in the 1600s, and it was called the Enlightenment. And it was really a time, it was uh, uh, just after the uh, Thirty Year War, around uh, 1648, and it went till the French Revolution around uh, 1789. And it was a time of deep thinkers who really were trying to free humankind from much of the super, super, I'm sorry, superstition and a lot of the uh, church teachings. And it really has affected many of us in the world today. And who better to tell us about that? And my guest today is Dr. Dennis Marshall. Deacon Jim. Doctor, good to have you here. Good to be here. You know, we, uh, we talk about this like it happened yesterday, the Enlightenment, but it was a long time ago, but it really has affected much of us in our world today. Isn't that correct? It has. And um, the Enlightenment, as you say, uh, started really in the 18th century. Okay, yeah. What, what preceded the Enlightenment, of course, was the Scientific Revolution and the Protestant Reforma Reformation, which set up uh, subsequently the Enlightenment. So before I talk about the Enlightenment per se, I just want to go back a little bit into the Middle Ages and, and set it up. <clears throat> because if we don't understand the historical process by which things came uh, to be as they are now, then we'll never get a grasp of the significance of the change that took place yeah. in those 200 years after the Protestant Reformation. In the Middle Ages, the Catholic world lived with this clear understanding, this clear cosmology, if you will, that God was at the center of things and mm -hmm. all of life, every aspect of life, uh, social life, personal life, internal life, interior life, ought to be ordered to God. Yes. And they may not have lived that ideal, <laughs> you know, that idea very well and completely, but nevertheless, it was the governing uh, framework within which they lived their lives. Father Barron, who was here back in mid-July, uh, he made this point quite clearly when he was talking about the stained glass windows of the Cathedral of Chartres. Mm -hmm. And he says, at the center you have, say, the, uh, the dove of the Holy Spirit. And around that circle, around the Holy Spirit, there's a circle of medallions that represent this entire aspect yes. of life. And essentially what those uh, are communicating is that we should live in such a manner as to know God above all things and everything else in relationship to God. Because when we do that, then, as it says in the liturgy and some of the Eucharistic prayers, we are capable of judging rightly the things of heaven and earth. So <clears throat> that, that medieval synthesis, that medieval worldview in the Protestant Reformation was challenged and collapsed. And, and let's just, so the viewers know, we're talking probably in the 1500s now, right? 15th, 16th century. 16th century, yeah. Right. 16th just so people century, understand so, that. you know, Luther in 1517 but you know what what the what happened at the reformation was preceded by um quite a ways into in the middle ages so it's not all of a sudden that this just popped out of nowhere exactly so the medieval synthesis that i just mentioned about knowing god above all things and and then being able to judge rightly the things of heaven and earth in light of the divine illumination uh that began to be challenged by catholic thinkers like um Don Scotus and mm -hmm. William of Ockham, some of, you've probably heard of these characters. And uh, essentially what, what these particular thinkers did is that they, they approached the idea of being and our ability to know God in, in a way that undermined our reasons, reasonable capacity to do that. Right. And ultimately with Ockham, what it came down to was that we couldn't really know anything about, about God himself at all by means of our reason. The only thing that we could know were his commandments by, by law, you see. Mm -hmm. And so God is no longer seen as an intelligent order of the cosmos who, who provides this harmony within the world and within our lives through grace and so on. Uh, 
but, but God simply becomes a lawgiver who imposes his will on us and squashes our freedom and prohibits us from doing whatever I, we want to do. I call him at that do. time, he became a benevolent dictator. That's right. Well, yeah. he wasn't even seen as a benevolent, benevolent yeah. dictator. Because by the time the 18th century rolls around with the Enlightenment thinkers, uh, th those thinkers like Kant and Descartes and others are throwing off these shackles of this oppressive divinity. Right so that they can stand in their maturity as rational beings and be the captains of their own fate and the masters of their own lives. So um, this, this whole process then uh, begins in the Middle Ages, kind of culminates with the philosophy of Occam, and then is the whole Catholic synthesis is shattered in the Protestant Reformation. And almost simultaneously to the Protestant Reformation is the scientific revolution. Mm -hmm. So what you have is this fragmenting of the Catholic worldview. You have this um, uh, challenge on the part of um, the Protestants who disintegrate the faith, and you have a great confusion thrown into the social order which, in which religion, which used to bind society closely is together, not. is no longer capable right. of doing that. Now we need a new basis of order. What would you say during that period of time that God was starting to come down a little bit and men were starting to elevate themselves I, I into a that, godly level? Now, I yeah. shouldn't say godly level, but becoming more equal. Right. I, I think that men were elevating themselves to God mm -hmm. more and more, and they were losing that notion of divine, yeah. um, divine transcendence. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, people, you could make a legitima, le, legitimate argument to say that Catholicism is responsible for the Reformation the, uh, and the subsequent loss of transcendence, but that's another story, and no, you're going to have to edit that out. No, no but that's, a, that's, an interest, <laughs> that's an interesting thought, because um, it, when you say the Catholic Church is partially responsible, because of the thinkers of the time, correct? Sure. Sure. And so they were starting to leave people to uh, a, a, a lack of understanding of divinity. Right. Or the source of all good, right. which would be God. Right. So when lack of confidence was lost in God and the Catholic worldview, and religion was no longer the unifying force within uh, Western civilization at the time, there was a, there was a need to establish an, a new uh, basis of order that was unifying and not fragmenting and because the sciences were beginning to become successful in, uh, in the world at the time, then it slowly be came to uh, clarity that it's human reason that is the basis of order yeah. in the world mm. and in society. So there's in this turning from God, the medieval synthesis, to the um, uh, scientific revolution as preceded by the Protestant Reformation, you have what, what is called later by thinkers like Kant in the 18th century, the turn to the subject, a turning away from God mm -hmm. and a turning to human beings. A turning away from God as the source and order of existence and the meaning of life to human beings as the source and order and the meaning of human life. A couple things I want to know. This was also a time when, when Galileo was also discovering more That's of the correct. universe, correct? Sure. So he was starting to see things in a different light and bringing that scientific knowledge right. to a different level. But sometimes I, I ask myself this question, and now I know we can't get in their heads because they don't live anymore, mm -hmm. but what do you think was behind their, their trying to discern this way and really trying to get... Their Catholic faith. Okay. Look, as, as Catholics, we're open to the fullness of reality, and God is the fullest reality that we can know. But as I said uh, in my little ditty a few minutes ago, Catholics want to know God above all things and everything in relationship to God. So to know, to know um, the things of God, the created order, and to know that order and to praise the creator for that order is a way of knowing God. Yes. So the idea that Catholicism is somehow anti-science and anti-progress in the sense of that is just just total nonsense. It is. Uh, you know, and it's funny because even uh, in the liturgy of the hours, many times in the evening prayers, 
it will say how uh, the church is is really uh, always looking at science and, and, and the church in harmony sure. and how God has opened up these minds to know the deeper mysteries of God. Right. Um, and yet somehow when we open those mysteries of God, we think we become the, the right. uh, deity. Well, the Catholic doctrine of the unity of faith and reason is one of the most beautiful things to ponder and to think about, and but that was lost. You know what happens in the uh, after the Protestant Reformation and the emergence of the scientific revolution is that um, reason becomes um, superior mm -hmm. to faith, right? And faith becomes a mere subjective opinion that is unprovable. Uh, by science that is um, merely an emotion or a feeling or some other such thing. And so consequently, um, religious, religious life and religious belief is even further dismissed as an important element within the life of human beings. And this is really going to uh, be a theme within the Enlightenment. Yeah. Because one of the things that Enlightenment thinkers like Voltaire and others, Diderot and others are going to do, is they're going to talk about how nonsensical and fantastical the Catholic faith is. It's nothing but popery and mummery and hocus pocus. And, and they dismiss it as com being completely irrational. And the beauty of the Catholic faith is, is that it sees faith as a way of knowing. Yes. It is, um, it is um, not an unreasonable act. But that's going to be dismissed in the Enlightenment. And we, and we see that the effects of that are seen in the idea that we experience today. You as a believer, Deacon Jim, are not to exercise your faith whatsoever when you step into the voting booth because there is no, uh, there's no reason why your religious belief ought to impact right. public <clears throat> policy, for example. That's a, that's a heritage of the Enlightenment. Well, and it's a, it's a dismissal of God in all things. Absolutely. So we, what we do is we say we compartmentalize God, right. particularly when in that type of situation. I think it's worse than a compartmentalization. I think it's what we would call a demonic revolt against um, the divine order. Yeah. And this is the same kind of demonic revolt in pride that uh, we see in the story of Adam and Eve. We understand in, the, um, in Satan's um, refusal to serve God. Yeah. So at the heart of the Enlightenment, even though we may not want to admit it, at least looking at it theologically, it's rooted in a prideful revolt against the divine order and tries to replace God with the human being. And this is what happens, really. So, so you have thinkers like, like Kant, who, um, who's the, he's the supreme Enlightenment thinker. And he thinks that human beings are so powerful that they organize mm -hmm. reality, they categorize it with their minds, they, they impose meaning on it, and so they're, they're little gods, it's essentially. They make words, their own moral rules and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Well, when you get to the 19th century, about 100 years after Kant or so, you get thinkers like um, Ludwig Feuerbach, whom I've taught you about, yes. Karl Marx, and so yes. on and so forth in which the highest and the greatest achievement of humanity is a political organization that controls as every aspect of our lives. And um, those kind of, uh, I'll call them utopian movements, um, uh, are rooted in the fundamental idea that the divine faith in a supernatural must be excluded. Yes. So the only world we have is this world, materialism. The only way of knowing the world is through um, scientific reason, that's scientism. And the only um, instrument by, by me, the means by which we come to understand the truths of these material things is reason, and that is rationalism. So we have these philosophical movements emerging out of the Enlightenment, scientism, naturalism, and rationalism, which all presuppose that there is no transcendent spiritual dimension to life whatsoever, and that the only type of life that we have is the life that we have in the here and now. And that changes our relationship, quite frankly, to the world in which we live. If, if the world in which we live now is the only world we have, and the life that we have now is the only life worth living, then history doesn't matter, the past doesn't matter. Behavior doesn't matter. Behavior doesn't matter. Uh, you might want to make the world a better place, but since you're not going to see the fruits of it, right. that's not going to matter. But, but here's an, um, And so you have this kind of emergence of an activism in which 
Human beings want to fashion the world in their image and likeness rather than understanding the order and the harmony within which God made it and then live in accordance with that. Yes. You, under, you understand what I'm Absol saying? Absolutely. And, and so we see this in sustainability movements and economicology and eco ecological movements and so on and so forth. I mean, these, these kind of things impact us down today. And, and I think that uh, while they may have some good things in them, they're fundamentally flawed because they're, they're um, uh, based on a falsehood, a right. false view of the world, a false view of the human being, sponsored by the, sponsored by the Enlightenment or encouraged by the Enlightenment. So, but here's the, here's the irony of this, this whole mess, so it seems to me, is that when we reject God from the Middle Ages in the, during the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment, and we establish reason as the superior foundation of all truth, well, pretty soon we look for the justifying foundations for that. We can't justify that either. Mm -hmm. And that happened very early with David Hume, who says, uh, you know, reason, whether, uh, whether reasoning is, um, uh, gives us any access to real information um, is one thing. He says, there's no real difference between me knowing the world and me scratching my little finger based on what I feel. I mean, these kind of things. So he, so he challenged this idea that reason was the supreme foundation of, of truth. Yep. And a lot of people spent a lot of time, philosophers, of course, trying to demonstrate the superiority of reason all over all other kinds of um, uh, claims to truth. And eventually what happens is that the confidence in reason experienced by Marx and others in the 19th century is lost in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. The Great War, uh, World War I, and World War II, these particular incidents shake the Enlightenment understanding of the human being to their very foundations. So much so that beginning in 1945, scholars start beginning to talk about a postmodern world, which is a, which is a word that you've probably heard. And that postmodern world is a recognition that um, enlightenment reason is not a sufficient means of engaging in the world and making meaning of it. Would it, would it also be a clear understanding of the two because of the enlightenment movement? There really would not lead people into a, it would take away a lot of the joy in living and a lot of the understanding of living for God oh, sure. and, and living a, a life of um, uh, meaning and right. purpose. Sure. And so we would lose that in that type of thinking because it would take away that objectivity of God being the center. Sure, so, uh, some would argue that. Um, we, we Catholics would argue that we can only live um, towards what is highest and what is higher than ourselves. It's the only thing that makes meaning out of our lives. And uh, rationalism, this, the enlightenment, it removes that highest mm -hmm. and it makes us the highest. Yeah. And, but it's not just individuals that are the highest, it's the political structure, the social order mm -hmm. that is the highest. Well, we've seen too many flaws in the social and political order to know that it's not any great shake. So even the evidence for that, that this is the highest achievement of human beings, is called into question. And when we despair over um, our ability to fashion a perfect world, to, to make the world a better place to establish peace and universal love and um, all this hippie nonsense. Of course. Um, we find that we waste a lot of our, the precious moments of our very limited life yes. on trying to make the world a better place and it's intractable. So when we despair of that, we fall back on living for ourselves, living for the moment, living for, to, to satisfy our desires, because that's what really makes me happy. Yeah. I, can't, I can't make you happy, I can't make the world perfect or anything like that, but at least I can satisfy my need for a beer. And, and so in reality, all this type of thing is really centered on yourself right. and making yourself happy, rather than going out and really fulfilling God's um, uh, purpose in our life to bring that, others that's right to, i mean st augustine identified this a long time ago right. in um the two primary movements uh, of of um human love are either love of god or love of self exactly and um of course it's the love of god that brings us into um a uh, true understanding of god the world the human being and society but when we turn away from god to ourselves in this um 
turning to the creature, the turning to the subject in Kant, then we're no longer connected to the, the foundations of the meaning of the world, and we're confronted with what Nietzsche would call um, our own godlike qualities in which we have to create meaning. That's right. And we can't do that. And um, it's impossible for we us can, to do that. We can create events, but we can never create meaning. That's right. Yeah. And, um, and we recognize that on some level, but because we, we live so cut off from God, we no longer have the wisdom or the ability to see. That would take grace, really, for us to see the wretched condition within which we find ourselves. Not, not only would it take grace, but a response to grace. Because many times people have that. The grace was available back then. That's right. But they didn't respond to that grace. That's, that's correct. And, and so it really leads people into this, uh, this, this enlightenment period. Was really, then carrying it even farther now, now, Dr. Dennis, we look at our world today. I mean, maybe we, today we call it um, um, uh, whatever this moral relativism that we're starting to live in. is kind of a, the enlightenment in our day today where people are turning away from God right. and really trying to live a life of satisfaction. Right. And that life of satisfaction is, as you can see in the world in which we live today, leads to a life of de degradation. There's this increasing, and I've, I've just noticed this over the past 20 years, maybe only because I've been paying attention to it, but I've been reading authors um, as early, as, as late as the 1890s and the turn of the 19th, uh, 20th century, who recognize the same things going on that we, we would see today, but there's this kind of uh, rapid, acceleration in evil in you know where we where we might give in okay let's give in a little bit here and but pretty soon we find ourselves on this slope in which um, there's an ever increasing uh, perversity mm -hmm. in in yeah. our wills and in our vices and so on and so forth and all of these things I think are an effect of our cutting ourselves off from God exactly and I made a point in a, in a talk a couple weeks ago, because it, it, it somewhat mirrors this, is that if you go back to the origins of the modern era with the uh, Protestant Reformation and the Scientific Revolution, and that cutting off from the Catholic, the Catholic root, um, essentially what happens is that uh, Western civilization separates itself from its spiritually vital force, because Christianity is really the primary force that builds the, the world, uh, the Western world in which we live. And over the course of the last 500 years or so, um, that, uh, that patrimony from Christianity mm -hmm. is finally exhausted. And the fumes, you know, the Western civilization used to run on the fumes of Christianity, but now that those have been exhausted, there's this increase in uh, perversity and degradation, in decadence, if you will, and I can't see, but help but see that unless there's a revival of the Christian spirit within the West, that there's going to be any reversal to that. Yes, and, and um, I see the more we capitulate to this, this uh, uh, disordered thinking, right. it accelerates all the quicker, as you said, That's correct. And, and, it, and it starts to perpetuate itself. And, and, and I'm thinking back to the Enlightenment period, even in the 1900s and, the, uh, and even the 20th century. Um, you know, people today, I, I look back and I ask myself, why was this so prevalent? What, what happened? And many times I see where they were rejecting um, the church's authority. Right. And it really came down to men and women rejecting any type of authority that would subject them sure. to something higher than themselves. Sure. And so they have to come to some other conclusion, like you're talking about, mm -hmm. and making themselves deity. Sure. Sure. If, um, if, uh, if God is no longer recognized as God, then we're the next best thing, yeah. and, and we're going to make ourselves that. And so it, it was in part an authority problem, but it was also um, a philosophical and a theological problem. We, we just can't uh, you know, point to this one instance. There, right. There's already what um, Eric Vogelin would call a spiritual illness. Where would those type of thinkers, and how would they answer a philosophical question that would say, where does your authority come from? How would you think they would answer that? How, how would I? How, how would they at that time? How would you think they'd like, uh, Constantine, how would, they, how would they answer that? Well, the, well, the Protestants say that the authority comes from their own, uh, their own selves, that they are the authority uh, capable of interpreting Scripture under the, at least under the uh, <clears throat> influence of the Holy Spirit, okay. so they would say. 
But it wouldn't be long then if you and I took that point that we would be disagreeing over the interpretation of Scripture, and then um, you'd have your church and I'd have my church, and your church would be going to hell and mine wouldn't. <laughs> and you see, so there's no basis ultimately <clears throat> uh, of judging that. Because there'd be no absolute truth at that point. Right. The, the rationalists have the, have the same kind of problem. Um, David Hume says, you know, it's nice, you scientists and you're, you're thinking, um, this is all great, but um, you're, just, um, you're just dealing with probabilities, not with certainties. <laughs> so what's the, what's the authority of your science, you see? Yeah. So the challenge of the authority of faith is challenged. Then comes the challenge of, to the authority of reason is challenged. What you're left with is feeling mm -hmm. right, and desire, and how can you how can you challenge that? We can't. Uh, well, it doesn't seem to me. Well, yeah, you, I, 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 you can, sure. but it's always based on this emotion. Yeah, but rather you have than to, truth. Well, you can, but you have to do it from the standpoint of um, reason and natural law. But if somebody rejects reason and natural law, then you've got no basis of having any kind of fruitful intercourse with anybody. That's right. You know what I mean. You know, we're, we're in uh, bringing it up to the modern time today, Dr. Dennis. You know, we're we're living kind of living proof right now of this type of thinking in our society because we're starting to see this slippery slope. We're starting to see a, a degradation of, of moral strength and character, uh, and we're seeing a degradation of people's faith, mm -hmm. really affecting to God. Um, there's, there, I mean, a lot of people are now turning away from God because they feel that they can do it on their own. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing a decrease in happiness. We're seeing an uh, increase in, in uh, 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 adultery. All these things that are really becoming mm -hmm. evident in a culture that is losing its boundaries. Mm -hmm in a society that's losing the boundaries because of that type of thinking. That's, that's correct. I, I think that, there, that there's um, uh, direct evidence of yeah. that. And, in, you know, St. Thomas makes this claim that um, sen sensual sins, you know, and notice we, we live in the, in the 20th and the 21st century basically to satisfy our sensual appetites. Mm -hmm. And he says this is the greatest source of um, uh, the debauchery of our minds. And so when you live in a sensual world like we do, then, then you essentially are undermining your ability to see the truth clearly, more so than if you committed any other type of sin. Yeah. And pr probably because um, we're so steeped in sensuality. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat myself um, fat. I'm going to drink myself silly. I'm going to um, make love to my partner you know, until I'm satiated or That's whatever right. the case may be. You see, so, so you're constantly titillated. And, um, and in that particular respect, you're short-circuiting your mind's ability to perceive truth accurately, not only moral truth, but ontological truth, the truth of our being and how we ought to be. Dr. Marshall, it's been a great discussion, and I wish we had more time, but uh, as uh, the cameras allow, we only get so much time on that. And the clock is letting us know that it's time, so I want to thank you for being here. Yeah. It's been a pleasure to, to listen to you again, because I always get so much out of it, and it's really a, a nurse understanding of, of who we are as Catholics and what it means to be fully human and to live in this world. So thank you again for being here. I want to thank all of our viewers, and we, as always, we, uh, we thank Dr. Marshall for being here, and we give all praise to Jesus Christ in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the the Holy Spirit. Amen.